James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Joseph Papp is perhaps the most powerful man in the American theater today. Twenty years ago, this product of the Brooklyn streets introduced free performances of Shakespeare to the parks of New York. Today, in addition to his summer theater in Central Park, Joe Papp presides over five off-Broadway theaters and has lately added two prestigious theaters in Lincoln Center. And just to prove a do-gooder can make it in the marketplace, he moved a pair of his plays, Two Gentlemen of Verona and That Championship Season, onto Broadway. Not only were they commercially successful, they both won Tony Awards. More recently, he's turned his talent to television with the successful play with music, Much Ado About Nothing, and the highly controversial play, Sticks and Bones. Mr. Papp, you're almost as well known as a fundraiser, as, as a producer and a director in the theater. And I've been told that you've raised over a million dollars a year for the last 10 years, and I suspect in the last year, probably more than that. I know you don't like begging for money. How should the theater be supported? What is the proper way in which to support a theater? Did you say I was a fundraiser? Fund, oh, fundraiser, fundraiser yes. yes. No, I've never heard of I've it never as been a fundraiser. I've been I accused don't. of that. <laughs> uh, how should a theater be supported? Yeah. The ideal way is through the, uh, through the box office. It should be self-supporting then, if it... No, the ideal way. Oh, the ideal way. Yes, if, if, if it could be self-supporting, that would be the best way to operate a theater. If it could be. Yes, but it's not possible if you're interested in, uh, in some uh, kind of continuity. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in um, merely in having a show run or make it, the best place for you to go is to the commercial theater, if you can raise the, the amount of money necessary to produce mm -hmm. a play and uh, take a gamble on a hit. And then there's nothing more, uh, there's nothing clearer than a hit, which means that people want to see this product and they pay for it at the box office. Sure. There's no, there's no ideology involved, there's no question of support by governments and so forth. It's a straight transaction in the same way you'd buy groceries or right. petroleum. But you're interested in producing more than hits, aren't you? Well, I'm interested in producing plays, per se. I'm interested in the theater, the art of the theater, which is not the same as producing, How, just what, putting what, on plays. What, what distinction do you make then? Well, the basic distinction, I think, lies in uh, my interest in the growth of uh, young talent, in the development of plays. It's like, it's rather than buying an orchard sort of straight out, mm -hmm. I like to plant seeds and see them grow. Which, and also, when I, when I do produce a play, which is like cutting the tree down in a certain sense, I like to replenish it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a sense of... Uh, of the, the past in the theater, what it has done, and what the function of a writer is today in our society, the meaning of the of, yeah. of the, uh, the That's what you mean by continuity, then, where as the, the simple performance completed finishes the, the process, but with what you're doing, the process continues because it is a process of growth. Well, and if I carry, carry this parallel a little further, mm. the, when the tree starts to bear fruit, you want that fruit to be uh, consumed mm. some way and uh, properly distributed. And uh, again, here the difference is also that I feel that uh, more people should partake of that fruit mm. than, than, than just merely those who, uh, uh, who have, have the money or, or those who have a, just have a particular interest in mm. the theater as a, a, a form of entertainment. You grew up without money. You grew up, uh, in fact, you, you've been quoted as saying you, you grew up surrounded by terror, grew up in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact. Well, yes, I was raised in a very poor and Poor your, your father was unemployed during Most the Depression. Of the time. So that, that having drama available, free or at 
There was Small drama course. available during the Depression. There was no problem about that. But yet you said that... Uh, I'm not talking about drama on the stage. I'm talking about oh, drama different kind of drama. Yes. What, kind of drama what kind of drama did you grow up well, with? Well, uh, anybody who's lived in the ghetto knows what that yeah. is. It's that sort of drama. I didn't yeah. know it as drama at the time. I thought it was just that was life. Later on, I began to understand this was also drama as well as mm -hmm. life. You've said in some context that uh, music and dancing were a part of that kind of life, but the oh, drama, much. drama uh, in the more formal sense was not. I, I didn't quite understand why music and dancing were a part of it. Drama is easy to understand. It was beyond you, as you've said, because of the cost. But was music and dancing easily available, or are you talking about music and dancing at dinner, again, in a different context? I mean, in, 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 the, in the very essence of it, music, mm -hmm. singing, uh, dancing on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, Your father was interested in music. He liked that. to sing. He was a good, he was a fine singer. Mm -hmm. We used to sing together. When I, I say the very, uh, the beginnings of, uh, of the theater, so-called, are usually is in the home or in church or in a synagogue, a place where you sing or where there's a ritual. And dancing, we dance in the street all the time. Mm -hmm. There's always street dancing. I mean, you just travel around any of the large cities. And uh, particularly amongst minorities, there's constant dancing and singing. Mm -hmm. It's the basic rhythm of life. Yeah. And uh, when it's transformed into, let's say, on a in some cases, not to a higher sphere, but in certain, then, then you have the essences where artists take what is basic to our rhythms and put them into other kinds of forms. And that requires a certain kind of artistry. What mm -hmm. the kind of dancing and singing I'm talking about just requires that you be alive and happy. Yes. Which, under those circumstances, was in itself something of an achievement, I That suppose. it was an achievement, an interesting achievement, I think. Did, were you uh, at all interested at that period of your life in the more formal uh, sense of uh, music, dance, uh, theater, or...? Well, I, I had no idea that there was a formal theater. I didn't know the theater existed. You'd have I, no reason to know that, would no, you? No, I had no reason. I, in fact, uh, uh, first of all, there was no theater in, in, in the area in which I lived. There was... But uh, I, there were records available occasionally, certain classical records, mm -hmm. which we stumbled across. I had early, there were early in my family, there were Caruso records mm. that had been found, not purchased, mind oh. you. And uh, somebody went out of business or somebody gave up an apartment and uh, came a stack of records which had, which had both Caruso as well as early jazz and became very interested in jazz at that time too. Plus the, the kind of music that existed in the time, which is mostly uh, a kind of a jazz, but at that time, uh, the early jazz was being changed and becoming a little more formalized into a uh, swing, yeah. that, that thing. But uh, I knew nothing about the theater at all. In fact, it wasn't until after I'd really gotten out of the Navy, uh, I, was some, I was 22 years old, and I mm -hmm. discovered that there was such a thing as the theater. You did do a little theater in the Navy, but you said you had only a passing interest. Well, it wasn't, wasn't theater. Wasn't I mean, theater, I would, anybody that was interested in the play was, you know, was, was a straight. I mean, that yeah. sort of person was a square kind of person. I was interested mostly in, in music, dancing, mm -hmm. vaudeville. And uh, your formal education ended at high school, didn't it? Yes. I stopped in high school. Rather unusual for someone who is so deeply involved so, and such a pivotal figure in the arts here in, in New York City. Well, the arts have nothing to do with formal education. That's right. They have no connection. It's an fact. important point, I And think. then sometimes it, is, it just has the opposite effect mm -hmm. on the arts. Really? The, yes. Mm -hmm. The arts have to do, with a, first of all, with an emotional sense of, of yourself and the world, a certain creative attitude, a certain imaginative uh, notion mm -hmm. about things, people, mainly. Uh, essentially, what you do is you learn your craft after a while. I did a lot of reading afterward and uh, became, became an expert on the Elizabethan period, in fact. This is after you left the Navy. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I went to the West Coast and became involved with the theater there because only I was sort of interested in acting at the time. You I were interested know what in acting I, at that point. Yes, mm -hmm. I acted somewhat, and, mm -hmm. uh, but mainly I became interested in directing and did, mm -hmm. did a lot of that. But that was all new to me. In fact, the first book I'd ever read was a, play, was a book called um, Masters of the Drama, John Gastner. Mm -hmm. I later received a degree in, in his name at some point, or some doctorate. Uh, I read the book. It, it was uh, from Aeschylus to O'Neill at the time. Mm -hmm. this, this is, I think he added Arthur Miller after that. Mm -hmm. But I began to suddenly realize there was a whole tradition in the theater. It went back to the Greeks and so forth, and that there were writers of various kinds, which I had no, which I had no familiarity. Mm -hmm. And I just began to read, and I just educated myself over several years mm -hmm. in this area. I but saw mainly, some I was reference to, 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 your, to your first part as being in Death of a Salesman and coming about because of some confusion that you were someone's nephew. I didn't oh, quite that's, understand. Oh, that's an interesting story. Is it like, a true like, story? Yes, I think I got the part because uh, s the stage manager did believe that I was the nephew of the producer. For some, some reason, it seemed that uh, someone I had known in New York had mentioned my name. He had been in the office of the producer. I'll mention his name, Kermit Bloomgarden, mm -hmm. a very distinguished producer, plays, did most of Arthur Miller's plays. 
Uh, and, for, and I didn't realize that. Why well, I had gotten this role? Because first of all, the role required someone very, very big and strong and uh, looking like an athlete. And I was short and, 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 not, and not the right size. Also, I had, had no experience, really, whatsoever, mm -hmm. very little. And uh, I was kind of amazed at the kind of treatment I was being given. Everybody was sort of so polite to me. It was very charming, teaching me everything about Lico's and you got to learn all about lighting and so forth at the time. And halfway through, they said, how's your uncle getting along? <laughs> I said, my uncle, what do you, Kermit, how's, how's Kermit, Kermit doing? Well, I suddenly discovered in that moment that they, they had assumed I was a nephew of this man. Mm -hmm. I, never, I never tried to tell them otherwise. I thought I may That's as well... That's something you do learn uh, in Brooklyn, I, I suppose. I may as well stay with admit. it. Well, it would be foolish, too. I'd want to destroy their illusions, <laughs> you know. I read O'Neill, say. <laughs> I believe the illusion should be maintained at all costs. And so I didn't uh, discourage anybody or let them think otherwise. You went very quickly then into directing, didn't you? Yes, even mm -hmm. when I was on the road with that show, yeah. I began to direct. Uh, when did company. you uh, stage the uh, O'Casey? Uh, oh, that was plays. my, was my that, first fiasco. I did. I did. Was that here in New York? Yes, in mm -hmm. New York at, at a at a um, they call it American Yugoslav Hall, which was later condemned by the Un-American Committee as a as a hotbed for subversives, oh. uh, mostly Yugoslavians, <laughs> you know. And I produced that, directed two of the plays, had someone else direct another, and uh, I made the unfortunate mistake at that time to use many blacks in the company. Why was it a mistake? Well, it was a mistake from a viewpoint of, uh, of the critic, uh, Brooks Atkinson, who was a great admirer of Sean O'Casey. Instantly, Brooks and I are very good friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, after, after seeing that, that production, he said, uh, whoever this chap is, he mentioned my name, uh, he should certainly think about getting out of the theater. He has no place <laughs> in the theater. He's ever destroyed a great, yeah. a great writer. I corresponded with O'Casey. And I, I was very close to the Irish writers. I, yeah. My first really interest was in Irish writers. Was Singh and Yeats and O.K.C. Your own very, very background much. obviously is not Irish at all. No, not at all. I'm mm -hmm. Jewish background. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have something in common, I think. Maybe it's the uh, the Irish mother has something in common. I don't know. Somewhere mm -hmm. along the line. Mm -hmm. But I met Sarah Olgood, who was the woman, uh, great actress of the Abbey Theatre, uh, who played uh, Juno in Juno and the Peacock, the mm -hmm. original production. And I saw that production, not the original, but a production that was later done in California, and I, I certainly admired it. But I admired the the poetry of, of the mm -hmm. Irish writers and and later. I, I think it was a very natural jump to go to Shakespeare. Yeah, and that was the jump you made at that point because you wanted a theater of your own. Well, I've, again, the idea of continuity, going back mm. to the first question yeah. you asked me, I don't like to be in, in a supermarket business of turning out products. Some way the work I do must have some mm. relationship to my life and to society. So the, uh, the theater itself always represents that view, my, mm. my theater. So you formed a, a small theater group in the, on the Lower East Side. Well, that was York. when I became interested in the, in the classics primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, we called it the Elizabethan Theatre Workshop, and I did, I did some Marlowe, mm -hmm. did uh, Edward II, and, uh, and juxtaposed uh, Shakespeare's uh, Richard, Richard II. Mm -hmm. And uh, I began to deal with a, with a, with a young company. These, these, these are pretty well-known actors now, uh, but at that time they were unemployed. Yeah. began to use black actors only because there were many black actors available. And they weren't being employed, and very talented one. Roscoe Brown, Roscoe Lee Brown was one of the early actors with his company. And we did a lot of Shakespeare, in, in mostly in contemporary dress, because we didn't have any money for anything. And That's why it was in contemporary dress. Yes, we, we borrowed the clothes, and yeah. I guess we stole some from various places. <laughs> we had people working in department stores, and we got various things. The, uh, the, uh, you know, the, I don't talk about the ethics of the occasion, but I think these people were glad they supported us, even though they didn't know it at the time. <laughs> in fact, CBS was a major support when I began to work for CBS. Uh, as a stage manager, mm. and um, they provided us with lots of lamps and cable and various other things. And didn't know it. Well, they didn't know it, but it was good for them because after what we signed a contract later on, and I paid off for them in some yeah. way, I would think. Shakespeare in the Park came out of this uh, project, then, didn't came it? Came out of the East 6th Street project, which mm -hmm. was on a, a church on the Lower East Side, uh, the Emanuel Presbyterian mm -hmm. Church. And we moved from there to the out of doors, there was a place on, on Grand Street and East River Drive, which was built during the WPA Federal Theater days. It was an outdoor amphitheater, seating uh, roughly uh, 2,000 people. And I saw the place, and I fell in love with it. It's right on the river. The Navy Yard was immediately across the way. And we'd hear, now hear this, now hear this, in the middle of performance. <laughs> but uh, we took it over, even though it was a very, very disreputable area. They'd had lots of violence there, and we were warned about bringing Shakespeare to that area. The Lower East Side Neighborhood Association said there'd been a stabbing just the night before and that it'd be foolish to try to, particularly Shakespeare, if we were going to do, uh, had some music or dancing, it might be better. Mm. But we had Shakespeare very successful. They yeah. packed the place all the time. And it started there. Then we moved to Central Park. I developed a mobile unit. 
that uh, began to tour the city, and it was pulled by a garbage truck, incidentally, and mm -hmm. it fell apart. And it wasn't until several years later, after we had become ensconced there in Central Park, that I developed a very more sophisticated mobile unit, which is still in operation, mm -hmm. which is a series of uh, platform trailers, 45 feet, with uh, uh, automatic um, lighting controls and so forth and so on. And we play throughout the city in various neighborhoods. And, of course, finally, the, the theater was built in Central Park. The Delacorte and Theater in Central theater. Park. And that's been, se what, seven, 17, 18 years now that you've played in Central, uh, played in the parks. Uh, Began in... Uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's less than that. Oh. Uh, it's been... It was... It's, uh, it's had continuity. Yes, it's been going on for a number of years. Yes, indeed. We've done, we've done well, almost I, all the plays of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Now, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the prime requisites that you set down for this was it to be free. But in 19, was it, uh, several years later when you had, uh, when the Commissioner of Parks, Robert Moses, a very powerful man, before you were a powerful man, uh, had a kind of David and Goliath fight over whether it shall or shall not be free. He was, ordered was he you, David and I Goliath or what? I never really quite understood <laughs> because things <laughs> certainly have changed now. Uh, he insisted that you charge admission. Yeah, he was, uh, he was quite an extraordinary man. Uh, but he insisted on an admission charge and, and uh, you fought tried him. to get us out. It was a major fight and mm -hmm. went on for months. The mayor was involved and everybody else. And Finally, we took it to court, and uh, you took it to court. The yeah. Shakespeare Festival. I, well, mm -hmm. I did. We were we were nothing like. Yeah. We were just like two people, and uh, we got a law firm to uh, to to uh, handle the suit without any charge. It was the mm -hmm. Wharton Rifkin Garrison uh, firm. Still, our lawyers have been fine, and, and you won it. We won it in the court. We were the last item on the calendar of the year, mm -hmm. and uh, we won it five to nothing. It was the uh, it was the court of appeals. We had lost in the lower courts. There was some judge, I think a friend of the mayor's, who turned us down, and while he quoted Shakespeare, that was insult to injury. And uh, then we finally got it on the calendar. First, they said, "Well, we don't know if we can get it on the calendar." I spoke to the chief justice there at the time, and and they finally got it on and said that the Parks Commissioner was arbitrary, capricious, and unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't impose a, 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 the edict on him. They just had to suggest that it was the proper thing to do. So he immediately insisted that $20,000 be raised to improve the uh, area. Uh, he kept claiming, for some reason or other, that the Shakespeare audiences were, were trampling the grass. So uh, there were a lot of uh, patriotic people that kept sending him huge bags of grass seed and kept getting it at the arsenal, which is the Parks Department headquarters. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's no longer Parks Commissioner, and I've been through four Parks Commissioners since him. Yeah. And, uh, and, but he was quite a uh, tyrannical uh, man, a very, very brilliant man in many respects. He's, his achievements are monumental. People say he created monuments mostly, and uh, he's responsible for a lot of the, uh, the highways and the byways. Yeah. So he was, he was the, he was the um, chairman or the head of, of about five or six separate uh, agencies, mm. city agencies. I want to turn your attention to the public theater, which you then created after the Shakespeare, not because, as you say, there was a surfeit of Shakespeare, but you wanted to turn to contemporary. Right. I, I was always interested in contemporary theater, yeah. but Shakespeare is, uh, in a funny way, he's an extraordinary man, and uh, his, the richness of his works makes, makes demands on actors, directors, and anybody working in the theater uh, has no better teacher. And uh, you, you can always turn to Shakespeare to yeah. understand certain of the problems of the, of the stage. He knew, he knew the theater. But uh, my major interest was a theater could not survive just on, on revivals of recreating Shakespeare from the olden days, even no matter how contemporary mm -hmm. we produced these plays and how modern they were and how vivid they were and how immediate they were. They were still plays written 400 years ago. And uh, I turned immediately, naturally, to the, to the writer, the contemporary writer, the man who's writing today. And built a writer's theater. Actually, it is more a writer's theater than any other kind of theater. Mm -hmm. And this with all due respect to very fine directors and actors and technicians, designers and so forth. But essentially, I, I operate from the writer. It's his ideas that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. When I say ideas, I don't necessarily mean someone give you some solution to the petroleum problem, yeah. but someone who has a certain kind of insight into our condition. And uh, I'm always interested in that. Mm -hmm. I am personally interested in that, so. You took over an old building in, uh, in Greenwich Village, the Astor Library. And it was the original, it was the first free public library in New York, but mm -hmm. it had been converted into a, a place for homeless Jews after World War uh, uh, II. Mm -hmm. And many, many refugees came there, many, many didn't, that escaped Hitler. Mm -hmm. That was before World War II, Hitler's tyranny. And uh, it was an old building, but it's Italian at Renaissance, quite lovely, but it was, it was in ruin. Well, you went heavily in debt to, to reconstruct well, that into... Two and a half million dollars worth of debt. Yeah. But uh, it's a, quite a beautiful building, and I'm very, I'm very happy that we, that building is preserved, because so many of the fine buildings are being destroyed or torn down or left to waste. I think we made that building viable. Mm -hmm. 
the problem with, with restoration of landmark buildings is that, well, you don't want to make, they usually manage museums, and there's no life in those things. Well, we made it very, we have five or six theaters operating there all at the same time. Different you opened the public theater with Hare, didn't you? That was the first play we did, Hare. Yeah. And then I did Hamlet after that, a modern version Why of Hare? Hamlet. That was a real departure at the time that that came on the stage, was it not? Well, you can never ask the question, why here at that time? I mean, uh, I just that uh, I had a choice. I was going to make a transition from Shakespeare. I just thought I'd make a quiet transition. I was going to do an English play, a contemporary writer, a very fine writer who wrote quite skillfully, high literary skill. And uh, I had optioned this play, and I was about to do it, and then I, I got a twinge. I felt, well, this isn't right for some reason or other. And then I was teaching at Yale at the time, teaching drama there. And on the way back, I don't teach anymore. I give that up. Uh, is um, I met Jerry Ragney, who was the, one of the authors of this thing, and he was, he was in a play or something up there, and he, he said he was working on something, and he had five or six scribbled pages, and uh, I looked at it, and I sort of was generally interested in it. So I asked him to write some more and let me see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that struck me about the material that it was that it dealt with the kind of loneliness of, of uh, young people, and it was at the height of the hippie movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became interested in it. Then I decided, I decided one day, I said, I'm not going to do that old play, that, that English play do an American play by American writers now. And uh, we involved Galt McDermott, who's a fine composer, who's now a millionaire, they all are, making, made a lot of money. But uh, I became interested in that particular uh, feeling. I mean, it, and it happened to coincide with other feelings that existed and it became quite a success. We made over a million dollars on that, uh, on the show, after we had sold it. I sold it to Michael Butler. Mm. Because we so the income from the hits have helped pay for the other programs of development? Well, in a, in a sense, yes. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in an interesting position, uh, at least I, I've selected that position, I pursue mm -hmm. it, is that uh, we're part institutional in a sense that we do require uh, constant fundraising to keep the institution going. On the other hand, we'd like to make, limit that if we could, mm -hmm. hopefully that we can make money in, in the general marketplace on our material, like getting into contracts with uh, CBS and doing you know, these particular specials. I'm interested in the commercial world, and going back to the original question, mm -hmm. Ideally, I would like to have no support from anybody yeah. except, the, except the audience. But then I would say my audience. When I say my audience, I mean people that would be interested in the kind of plays and uh, shows that I, I feel are significant. One of them. your purposes has been to, to develop new audiences. Now, is your audience uh, a, a broad audience or a narrow audience that's interested in the kind of thing that all you're theater, more interested in? All theater audiences are narrow are audiences. They? There are no broad theater audiences. Mm -hmm. The broadest theater audience exists uh, uh, when they, on, on Broadway in a sense, uh, when they go to see a big musical, a big musical hit or a star. That's the broadest theater audience you can possibly reach. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in that audience, mm -hmm. too. When we did Two Gen Gentlemen of Verona on Broadway, we were getting that kind of people. Yeah. And I liked it better than downtown, in a sense. It was much broader. On the other hand, downtown at the public theater, when we're not playing uptown at Lincoln Center or the, uh, or the, uh, the Broadway theaters, we do get, for the most part, a more uh, discriminating uh, audience, uh, but in a sense, these audiences are more likely to respond to new works and accept mm -hmm. that without feeling that their their integrity or something is being threatened. How will the, your your uh, uh, assumption of responsibility for Lincoln Center affect your desire to reach these new audiences? That one thinks of as kind of established audience that goes to Lincoln Center regularly, well, I, identifiable I, kind of audience. Yes, I, I don't know. We we've uh, we have twenty six thousand subscribers, uh, of which. Uh, 8,000 are new subscribers, 18,000 are people who have subscribed to Lincoln Center before. We're getting some flack from some of those 18,000. Yeah. Uh, I've put on my first production there, which is a play by David Rabe called Boom Boom Room. Mm -hmm. He's the man who wrote several plays about the war in Vietnam. Uh, but Sticks and Bones, Sticks and Bones was the most, people most, most people recognized. Mm -hmm. It was done on television and created a great controversy. Mm -hmm. But this is a very interesting play about a go-go girl, mm -hmm. but he's still, he's still in Vietnam in a certain sense. In other words, the battlefield is... Uh, the same metaphor as the yeah. as the go go hall, and as I thought, as a fantastic play, and uh, it got uh, the major critics here panned it, panned them, mm -hmm. panned it. Uh, particularly Clive Bonds, who assaulted the play, uh, he felt you've something. You've not had much love of critics, uh, even though you've fared fairly quite well over the years, have you not? Well, the the it, see, the, this, there's a notion somewhere that you know, naturally people in in the arts always hate critics, but there's a basis for that. And it's not just a petulant uh, mm -hmm. kind of thing about uh, sour grapes. Naturally, everybody loves the critic that praises his work. Sure. I've, I've had contempt for some critics that praise work that, I did, that I've done, which I felt was poor. 
On the other hand, I feel they fail to recognize some very, very important things. So that it isn't, uh, there, and there are variations within the groups themselves. There's some very fine writers, critics. Mm -hmm. Harold Clorman is a very fine critic. Uh, Jack Kroll of Newsweek is a very fine critic. Ted Kalem uh, sometimes comes out with very, very fine things. The daily critics, I've always liked Douglas Watt, who writes for a mass newspaper, the, the, um, even though he didn't like Boom Boom Boom, I do respect him. He writes for the Daily News. Uh, Clive Barnes is somewhere, there's a pretentiousness there somewhere, that uh, great liberalism and love and so forth, that I have a feeling that, uh, that essentially I question the integrity of the writing mm. and, the, and the viewpoint. Uh, Douglas uh, 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 Watts, who writes for the, uh, for the uh, New York Post, is an elderly gentleman, very, he's very, very, he's barely making it. But uh, occasionally he responds in a very genuine, childlike way. And other times he's totally bewildered yeah. by what's going on. Then you have, you have hatchet men like John Simon, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, in a certain sense I have more respect for than the Clyde Bonds, even though he's cruel and... Uh, so it, it has nothing to do with what they say, but how they say it. And, that's right, it's a whole attitude. See, we, we in the theater make their livelihood possible. Yeah. And, you know, people are hit. They, they think they're playing with toys. There are certain writers and there are, there are, there are actors. Yeah. Well, there are writers, for example, in particular, whose lives are their writing. I mean, that's where they live, and that's why they write. They're attacked mercilessly sometime or in some kind of uh, irresponsible way. There's nothing to say that people should not be criticized, that these people don't have a function. Mm -hmm. But I think they, 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 they lose the sense of, of what the impact of what they say has on, has, has on these people. And also they're, they're backed up by huge uh, newspapers. And, uh, and uh, so the impact is really uh, very, very poor. And it's destructive, you see. Mm -hmm. So I don't accept the, what they say. I, I, I demand the same forum. You know, I don't have this, their space, but I demand the same kind of uh, retaliation that they uh, do to me, and uh, I feel it's only fair. We in don't the, have in that the space. half minute remaining, I want to ask you a, a, a difficult question, which I think you can probably answer very simply. Given all this and the responsibility you have in the theater and the kind of thing you were just talking about with respect to critics, do you ever have moments when you wake up and say, is all this really important? You're assuming I go to sleep when you raise that question. I just, maybe you don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always question that. Do you? I always question the importance. Every yeah. artist does in some way. Mm -hmm. Saying, is what I'm doing really important? And uh, I, I really don't know. People tell me that more mm -hmm. than, I, than I really know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, the thing itself is not important. It's meaningful to me. Whether, it's, uh, whether it has the same relative importance to others, I don't know. I doubt it, really. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I say, here we rush to an opening night, and we're so, we say, everything depends on it. But you know that 99% of the population has the slightest awareness of what's going on on this great night. Thank you very much, Mr. Papp. You're welcome.